Um, yeah, I, I should frame, frame what I'm saying in, I'm a really bad academic, but I tend to like doing stuff in industry, and I kind of call the heritage NGO sector industry as far as I'm concerned, because um, working within a business school setting, as I've always done, um, I've been interested in the way that we manage organisations and how organisations then develop knowledge and that, therefore, that interface of where they get that knowledge from and how they translate that has been really kind of what's driven me along the way. So, um, if you'll forgive me, I'm, I'm going to frame what I'm saying in terms of a slightly biographical thing over kind of 20 years of being a bad academic, um, picking up on some projects, four, four case studies that I've been involved with, um, to try and highlight a couple of things around what we mean by policy and policy engagement, but also what it means for me, what it has meant for me as an academic with a, trying to develop a career, um, therefore what it's useful potentially to think about other people in academia who might want to look at career options and kind of general career development and things like that, because it's, a, it, it's, it's an area, if you get really into thinking about policy and getting involved in it, it kind of sucks you in and can drag you in a number of dangerous directions. Um, Hannes, Hannes covered some really good stuff on, on sort of what, what policy is, but I, I'm, and it, it is the, the, the peril of it, I, I think, is that it's, it's the generic term, but it can be really complex in terms of the scale, its relevance and its ambition. And sometimes it's, it's therefore less about policy and more about the ways of working, uh, which are really, really important. So how organisations, governments go about the approaches to things, how they form their ideas and their responses, and therefore an awful lot of initiatives that come out of it. Because we think of, and, and, we, and we see it through some of the sort of the, the UKRI and the, Re the Research Council sort of expectations around outputs and outcomes and impact, that it can be easy to fall into that mindset of, oh, I've got to influence something that a government decides to do. And that's kind of a big ask, actually. And actually what might be slightly better is doing, uh, looking at how this applies in the different scales. And that could be at a community base. It could be at a local government base. It could be at an organisational scale as well. So thinking about policy in the broadest terms of policies are created by organisations, they're created by sector groups, they're created by sectors themselves, as well as just the you know, governments in its broadest sense. Um, for heritage, it's, it's, it's challenging, I think, um, because once upon a time, um, I mean, I'm, I'm interested absolutely in, in heritage policy, um, so what it means for the heritage, um, or particularly of the UK. Um, heritage is that, you know, great, there's an awful lot of heritage academics who've spent the last hundred years trying to define what heritage is, <laughs> which is enough to kind of make me run screaming from a room, um, because it, it's, it's a bit of a fuzzy, fuzzy subject area. Um, and it's not helped to some extent by when you then put this into this global context and how, how heritage relates into the, the, the sort of the GCRF overview, that suddenly you can see where heritage can do an awful lot of things for an awful lot of people in an awful lot of places. And yet, at an individual level, we're, working, we're having to work on very specific, um, specific areas, specific research questions, um, and then can try, have to try and reverse that and translate that out into the, into the wider world. So one of the questions that I've always kind of tried to think about is, is are, am I wanting to do something for heritage and a particular part of the heritage, or am I using heritage as a context to do something in another context? Is this about heritage and well-being? Is this about climate change? Is this about housing? Is this about poverty? Um, and so you sometimes end up having to think about sort of research and evidence and, and, and outputs and outcomes of what you're working on to think, well, you know, who is, who is this doing, who is this potentially doing something for, which might be very different from the research question and the research framing that you started with. Um, this, is, uh, this is, you know, something that was stolen from, I've stolen this from, from, from DCMS, and, and 
one of the things I put on the, the, one of the previous slide, you know, caution of mainstreaming, and this very much talks to a, to a, to a Scottish context, that over many years the heritage sector um, has at times felt unloved, um, the NGO sector particularly, I know it felt, felt it was a low priority within government, that once upon a time we had a department for national heritage, but that was turned into a department for culture, media and sport, now a department for digital cultural media and sport, and a feeling, particularly within NGO organisations, sometimes the smaller <coughs> ones, particularly the heritage might have been dropping down the, down the agenda. Um, and, you know, the purity of archaeology or uh, something that we can identify as a specific, particular heritage asset suddenly gets bound up in this broader morass of other things and fuzzy edges of, of heritage. So, particularly in the, in the, in the Scottish context, this was, has been a very live debate over the last 10 years, that sort of heritage wanted to be mainstreamed. Um, this idea of, of heritage policy being not treated on its own, but being part of a wider government agenda. And so an awful lot of work within, within NGOs in the heritage sector um, over the last 10 years in Scotland have... have have worked towards thinking about how heritage can work in a whole lot of other broader areas and are now at that point of thinking, oh, be careful what you wish for, because now having been mainstreamed, what was a dedicated heritage policy department or policy team within the Scottish Government has kind of been disbanded into a, and, and reformed into what, what had a team of 10 people at one stage now has a team of two people as part of a wider culture, heritage and environment department. And mainstreaming, suddenly bits of the NGOs within Scotland are saying, well, hang on, we used to be special, we're not special anymore, we're having to fight for attention a lot more, and therefore having to marshal evidence much more in a much quicker way, and therefore wanting to look to academia and, and the projects working at both the global, regional and local scale, to try and help marshal, marshal that evidence. Um, bringing that back again, sort of to thinking about this, I mean, it, it, it sort of, I was trying to, when I was asked to come and, come, come, come and talk for a few minutes on this, it got me thinking, say, well, okay, well, is, does that mean that I've therefore had some kind of actual research focus in what I've been trying to do? Because I'm, a, you know, I'm an applied academic, I, I kind of, tend to respond to things and, 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 and uh, consultancy projects and things like that as opposed to the traditional form of, of larger research council funded projects. Um, but it, it kind of got me thinking about, well, what is that doing for me and my own research interests and thinking about, this is about areas of management and working within a business school and management context and how that relates back to policy is thinking about the strategies of organisations or organisational structures, how they manage knowledge themselves, think about what evidence means, those outputs and that engagement, and all of those have aspects that feed into different, as different, different realms of policy. So, so, four mini case studies then around sort of the, that engagement with, with policy. So, and I apologise for the colour of our corporate slides at Harriet Watt, they're grey, which means they don't show up on anything. Um, uh, UK HRG was, um, this was something that came, that was established back in 2001, so a long time ago now, by the then Heritage Lottery Fund. The UK Heritage Research, or Historic Environment Research Group, very much as a self-help group for organisations that were in the sector that were um, scratching their heads and going, well, we're beginning to commission research. Um, policy officers within... Uh, DCMS, within the National Trust, within HLF, within um, various, you know, both in large NGO and, and different de uh, governmental departments, Co commissioning research um, to, to work out what heritage means and what heritage does and the value of heritage. Um, and they needed to get together to think about that because they were all commissioning individually and not necessarily sharing what could be pooled responses or pooled calls for evidence. That worked for about 10 years, um, through to about 10, 2010, 2011, and gradually fell out of use because 
At the time of austerity, a lot of policy research-focused people within government departments, uh, particularly in some of the larger heritage organisations, effectively vanished and changed, and, and research was um, had to be much more targeted and much more sort of efficient in its turnaround. So that became a virtual group and then fell into abeyance, but has come round again with the idea of, of a potential heritage observatory, precisely to think about how heritage, you know, the world of what's going on in heritage research relates to what needs to happen in, in policy and for organisations. And this is about, you know, supporting a sector, you know, the heritage sector we think of, you know, we think of government departments like DCMS or like the Scottish Government. We think of large organisations like the National Trust for Historic England. But the rest of the heritage sector is tiny, tiny organisations in many respects. And they have no capacity for really engaging in, in, in policy. It's not, it's not their core concern or their day-to-day -day job. But policies that we are generating research and evidence about may well impact very substantially on what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So as a trustee of, of, of the Heritage Alliance, you know, we look after the interests of, um, effectively, we, you know, we try to you know, cover the policy interests of a range of about 130 different heritage organisations, from the giant at one end, like the National Trust, through to the Bordsy Radar Trust, which is one retired gentleman looking after a historic building in the depths of Suffolk. Now, heritage policy may or may not, you know, around something like agriculture, may or may not be more or less relevant to him. It's very relevant to the National Trust. It's much less relevant to a guy running a, a former wartime you know, bunker in Suffolk. However, the ability to tap into that resource and that evidence base and where academics can feed into policy is really, really important for them. And that's sort of very much what's, what the role of the, the, the Heritage Alliance is trying to do. Um, but that idea of there's an awful lot of evidence out there, and it goes back to particularly what Hannah, Hannah was saying earlier, the fact that I've sat in so many conversations over many years, particularly around sort of heritage policy at sort of in the Heritage Alliance and the Built Environment Forum, where we're saying, oh, well, we need to justify the, justify the value of heritage. Uh, we don't have enough evidence. And I've been saying for 20 years, we're knee deep, we're neck deep in evidence. It's just, it's the translation of it. It's getting those ideas, precisely as I'm saying, into the right language. And the fact that, you know, policy researchers and, you know, in some of the larger organisations in government don't have access to the, that material. So one of the things about in engaging with, you know, sort of policy and framing it is that, you know, ideas are of the time and they will come round again. And there is a cyclical thing around this, but, but it, you know, knowledge and how we manage knowledge is really, really important and translate to it. Second case study I want to mention is, is um, heritage auditing. Um, so what is now, um, what, what now appears each year within England as the Heritage Counts uh, programme of research. Um, and every couple of years in Scotland as Scotland's Historic Environment Audit and started originally um, as the, the State of the Historic Environment Report. So my involvement in that was, was, you know, I can tick it on, you know, that's on my gravestone. I kicked all of that off. Um, but the gestation can be long, but the association short. So I'm no longer involved in those, but, but was, you know, happy that the... And that came out of came out of tourism research that I was doing at the time, looking at visitor attraction numbers and the management of, of visitor attractions within the tourism economy, so answering questions about what do visitor attractions do for the tourism economy, and most of those visitor attractions were heritage attractions. Um, and the heritage sector at the time was saying, well, you know, there's this tension between are we being driven by a tourism uh, a tourism focus, or are we? Do we need to think about more about community and conservation and and um, what heritage means for wider society and for value? Um, so that was where you know I was thinking about sort of the, was the work at the time that I was doing was thinking about tourism policy. Actually, translate translating that was into an approach to marshalling evidence within the heritage sector. So I wasn't trying you know wasn't trying to affect heritage policy out of this, but it was trying to support heritage policy development by gathering together that, that, um, that information and think, starting to think about the evidence base and proxy indicators 
and you know, thinking about heritage auditing or heritage, you know, the annual process of gathering together information, and that answering a number of research questions in itself. So the Heritage Counts program in England <laughs> undertakes a thematic set of questioning each year. The one in Scotland brings together a set of, set of indicators looking at the state of health of heritage and how it, how it um, you know, plays a role within, within wider society. So that was you know, what started as work in the tourism policy arena, actually, uh, of tourism, very much practical management, where I was thinking could be, could be applied in tourism policy, thinking about approaches that the national governments of the time had around tourism, um, the, the support for the visitor attractions sector, actually turned into thinking about knowledge management in the heritage sector because of the relationship between those two. So it took in, a, took in a, an unexpected direction. Um, seeing something which does potentially turn into a policy um, and then seeing the effects coming out of that was work again that, that has considered aspects of value and this was this was um, so, the, so our place in time which is the Scotland's um, is the historic environment strategy for Scotland so this is a quite an interesting policy <coughs> in itself because it's deemed to be Scotland's policy not the Scottish government's policy which means at any one moment members of the Scottish Parliament can point and go, well, who does this belong to? Well, it's all of, it belongs to all of us. Um, that the strategy and policy cycle, that you'll, you know, uh, you know policy academics will, you know, you know, talk about the strategy cycle or the policy cycle. Um, it, it tries to follow that model to develop, again, support for what a strategic approach to heritage is within an entire country. That came out again from, from uh, you know, uh, and the, really the point I want to illustrate with this is that the time taken to get to a national policy involved a huge number of people and a huge number of workshops and a huge number of involvements. Weren't really coming out of a specific research question, but also out of a broader approach that needed to be taken. But you could see influences along the way of value models that had been produced in heritage from around the world, from you know, work that had come out of the National Park Service in the States, Society of American Archaeology as well, thinking about the value of heritage, um, thinking about things that had been taught, you know, developing in, in, in business school kind of management ac academia, thinking about logic models, the Wisconsin model, which suddenly, suddenly appeared in, in, in a few years back in, in Scottish government policy um, meetings for, for heritage when suddenly we were all being introduced to the Wisconsin model where I think somebody had been on a training program and the Wisconsin model had been flagged up. You know, take a town somewhere, call it a model and you know, it'll some, somewhere, sometimes sometimes emerge in the policy process. Um, and where we're now seeing you know, lots of talk around the theory, theories of change um, a lot of these are kind of, kind of you know, management models where you start to see a range of inputs from, from different subjects and different research questions coming in to think about how decisions get made and how you measure, therefore, the success of the heritage sector coming out. And some of that then I'm seeing going back out into international work now where... Heritage has been sort of the, the value of heritage has made it into a national strategy and the national strategy is now feeding into how Scotland deals with its international relations with the West, rest of the world through cultural diplomacy and soft power, um, particularly in sort of the work that I'm, do, I'm doing in China at the minute. Um, final case that I just want to kind of flag is, is prioritisation. Um, and this is when the role of um, the academics sitting outside the organisations can be really, really useful. So this is work that's going on in Scotland at the minute, which is a response very much to austerity, and there is no more money for, you know, heritage organisations, um, if I'm being uh, really mean about them, um, would, you know want to save everything, if I'm going to do a very broad generalisation, want to save everything, 
not very good at prioritizing and constantly flagged the need for more money. Um, we've got to a point now where you know, there perhaps isn't any more money, so we need to prioritize what we're doing in a much better way. And in a Scottish, um, uh, a, a Scottish context, it goes back to that, that closeness of relationship that you, you mentioned with, 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 with the Scottish government. The Scottish government being very, very interested uh, and par parliamentarians in Scotland being very interested in what heritage can do and how, uh, how, what it can do at a local community level and how it plays on the national stage internationally and how organisations, particularly public sector organisations, are working collaboratively together because Scotland has got a set of national outcomes that the Scottish, Scottish uh, government um, expects all public organisations to feed in towards those national outcomes, and the heritage sector, is, is uh, as part of that, is expected to play its role through <coughs> Historic Environment Scotland and through heritage assets being managed by major public organisations like <coughs> Scottish Natural Heritage, like the MAD in Scotland, like the court service, like the hospitals, like that, and so on. So the role of the, the you know academic research into the, sort of helping the prioritization is is being able to sit outside it and having an outside role is really really important um, that to be able to think in that broader sense about scenario planning for what do things mean in a global context and how does that therefore help organizations begin to to prioritize final slide trying to pull all of that together what what is that what has that meant, and what has that meant for, for me and for what I'm, what I'm doing? Um, uh, getting involved in policy, I think, is, is really important for us to do. It's that translation of ideas and thoughts into practice, which is absolutely being called out for. You know, people, you know the, the, the parliamentarians, organisations, policy makers are, want input and evidence. Personally, it means it's a time commitment. Um, and the way I've squared it was that, you know, I stepped back from being a full-time academic to being a three-quarters time academic to spend more time on this um, as a personal decision, which is quite, quite a major personal decision for me to make because it's what I'm interested in because I could not carve out the time within the academic management framework in which I was working. So projects that I'd been funded to do, um, there was kind of an expectation of a policy involvement, but actually the requirements on the time and the commitment over time was very major. So the work involved in, in, in supporting just a tiny, tiny bit of what went into the Our Place in Time strategy was four different committees meeting multiple times over the course of a year email traffic backwards and forwards, collaborative groups online. You know, the time commitment was major that just couldn't be factored into the actual evidence I'd been actually commissioned to, to, to write and provide for, for some of that work. Um, I think it's, it's only right to, is, to, to, to flag in a minute, you know, time, you know, time and mental health issues and, you know, welfare within, well-being as academics working within this sector. There's a lot being expected of us. You know, we're, we're, and getting involved in policy, it takes time to sit and think and commit to the doing that. Um, because to have a real effect, I think it does mean a, a kind of mental long, longer term commitment. Be and working as, uh, and, um, as I think as Re Re Rebecca said, trying to get your mind in two different places of big research questions with timescales that work over a long time, versus something, can I turn something around and translate that in language to something that's needed next week for an organisation? Um, I think I'm, it's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a positive journey, and I think there's, there's uh, a lot that we, you know, there's so much that's going on within the GCRF um, programme. There's so many, so many things that can be translated back into the sector at all kinds of levels, I think there's real opportunity, but it does take time to translate that. And that language of translation is the final point that I want to say, is, is really, really important. We can be quite 
definite. We, we, we're nervous as academics about being too definite and just making bold statements because we want to provide the evidence behind it. But I think at times there are, you know, we should have the confidence to say that actually experience counts. We are experts as researchers and academics. Um, we can provide that institutional memory as well because we work on things over a long period. And that does count. So sometimes our views are just important for being in the room, even if it's not there to actually suddenly have a change in policy which you can put down to, oh, I did that kind of thing. Thanks. Thank you.